lovely to see you. Good to be here. It's my job this morning to come and uh, explain a little bit about what it is we're doing and why we're doing it, and to do that according, not just to some ideas that we've had, but according to uh, the Bible. As Christians, uh, I hope if you're visiting today, you're aware that we're Christians, uh, uh, or at least a lot of us are, uh, and we want to do what God is asking of us, and we believe that God speaks to us, and he does it primarily through this, through the Bible. And some uh, of our team are coming around with Bibles now, so if you'd like to be able to follow along, uh, then please do uh, put your hand up, and uh, they'll be able to bring one to you. As you've heard already a few times this morning, we are embarking on a month of prayer. And I want to be really clear, because there's always a danger with sort of kicking off a month of prayer on a Sunday when there's going to be someone speaking, there's going to be someone preaching. Um, it's always a danger to think that what we're really doing is we're just introducing a sermon series about prayer. We're not doing that. This is not a sermon series about prayer. This is a month of prayer. So what is a month of prayer? Well, I think the best way I could explain what a month of prayer is, is it's this. It's a month of prayer. Yeah? It's a month where we don't talk about prayer, where we don't just think about prayer, where we don't just learn about prayer. It's a month where we pray. And obviously there's lots of different ways that we can do that, and that might look different for all of us. I'd really encourage you to dig into that booklet, to take, take a bit of time. It'll take about 15, 20 minutes maybe to read it cover to cover. You might want to do that. You might want to break it up, but just sort of get to grips with all of the different opportunities and prompts. So I don't want you to get to the end of the month and go, oh, I could have done that. That was an opportunity. Have a look, see what's out there. I'd encourage you to sign up for those prompts and all of that. But for now, I'm going to stop talking about that. And instead, we're going to look at God's word. We're going to look at the Bible and look at some of Jesus's teaching about prayer, some of his instructions and his encouragement. Next week, we're going to be looking at the most famous prayer in the whole of human history, the Lord's Prayer. But this week, we're going to look at Jesus's little introduction to that. Because, because before he tells his followers what to pray, he tells them how to pray. There are two really important lessons for us to learn as we look at this. So it's in Matthew chapter 6, and uh, Matthew is right at the beginning of the New Testament, the second half of the Bible. Uh, Matthew chapter 6, and I'm going to start reading at verse 5. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 5. You may have a slightly different version in front of you than the one I'm reading, but hopefully you'll be able to follow along. Matthew chapter, five, uh, Matthew chapter 6 verse 5 starts like this. And when you pray, okay, let's pause there for a moment. I promise we'll, we'll, we'll go a little bit faster in a second. But Jesus starts with, and when you pray. He's assuming that the people he's talking to pray. He doesn't try and convince them to pray. He doesn't try and coerce them into praying. He's assuming that they pray. He's speaking to some of his followers. He's speaking to his friends those who've decided to follow in his way. And he, he starts talking about prayer and he says, when you pray. So I guess there's a question for all of us. Do we pray? Is prayer part of our lives? I'm going to guess that for most of us, it is in one way or another. That might look hugely different for each of us. But I'm going to guess that in one way or another, prayer is part of your life. Maybe you pray when you're in a hurry and you're already late and you've lost your keys and you can't find them. Maybe that's the moment, those sort of panic prayers, those sort of, ah, it's, I, I, I need something to happen, I need it to happen quick, and it's a shooting up to God prayer. I think, that's a good, I think that's a good prayer to pray. Maybe we pray before our meals, we give thanks for the meal that we're about to eat. Maybe we uh, pray with our children before we put them to bed in the evening. Maybe there's a bit of space carved out every single day in our life where we sit down and we pray, or we go running and we pray, or we go for a walk and we pray. Maybe... When big uh, national or international crises or events happen, a national disaster or a shooting or something like that, we don't just tweet or put on Facebook, hashtag pray for something or other. We actually do it. Maybe we pray when we see something that is so big that we don't know how we or other people are going to be able to handle it, and so we pray. For most of us, in one way or another, prayer will be part of our lives. Maybe we feel we know the person that we're praying to. Maybe we feel as though we don't. Maybe you're here this morning and you don't feel as though you know God or you're not sure you know who he is or know about him. But every so often there's that sort of desire to reach out to something that's bigger than you. That's prayer. I want to encourage you not just to embrace prayer, but to embrace the one that I believe we should pray to. 
But however you are, wherever we are, when we look at Jesus' words that say, when you pray, I'd encourage you this month, maybe this week, maybe today, to try and take a decision, take a step to increase that, change that, step it up a notch, do it in a different way, try something different, try something different, play around, experiment with prayer during this month. I'd encourage you, wherever you are and however you are, to pray. So, let's carry on. He says, when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. This is the first of two things in this passage that Jesus says, don't pray like these people, but instead do this. And it starts off, he starts off with the people that he calls hypocrites. He says, don't pray like hypocrites, for they love to stand uh, praying in the synagogue and on the street corners to be seen by others. Now, Jesus is speaking to Jewish people. And Jewish people of the day, uh, there were sort of set times of day when they might pray. There were set prayers that they might use. And they could choose to do those things privately or to do those things with other people. Both of them were okay. Both of them were seen as acceptable. But he, 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 he doesn't just say, don't pray around other people. What he says is, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray standing in the synagogue. Imagine we're in a, we're in a synagogue. It's a room that's not that dissimilar to this. Um, and, and there's lots of people, and they're all praying because it's the set time of day when they would all pray. Some are kneeling, some are sitting, some are by the edge of the room, some are praying quietly. Some, though, are stood right in the center of it, praying loudly so that everyone might see them, so that everyone might hear them. And then this other example of them, they love to pray standing on the street corners. Now, the thing about a street corner is that on the corner, you're visible by people on two whole streets. It's not just standing in the middle of the street where one street's worth of people can see you. It's on the corner so that everyone can see you. And again, when there are set times of day that you might pray, it is possible for you as a person to order your day so that you just so happen to be on the street corner. At, oh, it's time to pray. I happen to be there and I have no, no choice but to pray because I'm a very pious and religious person. See, this is not talking about people praying and being heard by other people full stop. This is praying. This is talking about people who are praying for the benefit of other people thinking they're impressive. Could you do something for me? Could you point at someone else in the room? I'm going to point up there. You've all got fingers. Come on, here we go. Point at someone in the room. Now point at someone else in the room. There we go. That's what prayer shouldn't be. Prayer shouldn't be an exercise in getting people to look at us and point at us. Prayer is not about me looking impressive to someone else. Prayer is not about you looking impressive to me. See, Jesus says that these hypocrites, they love to pray. The word hypocrite, by the way, is borrowed from Greek theatre. Remember uh, where there would be actors who'd be on the stage with these huge, great, elaborate masks that would, uh, that would be sort of larger-than-life expressions and emotions. But behind them, there's just a person saying some lines. It's someone who puts a mask in front of their face to appear bigger and more impressive than they are. That's what a hypocrite is. It's a mask in front of face wearer. Jesus is saying, when you pray, don't be like that. Don't put on a prayer voice. Don't put on a prayer front. Don't pray for the benefit of other people thinking you're more impressive than you are, more spiritual than you are, more holy than you are, more intelligent than you are. Don't pray for their benefit. Because if that's your audience, he says, then these people have already received their reward in full. If they're praying so that other people think they're impressive, it might work. But that's all they're going to get out of prayer. It's just for the benefit of other people. So the first sort of thing that Jesus, Jesus talks about is about our audience. Who is the audience of our prayers? He says, don't be like the hypocrites whose audience is other people. Instead, he says, when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. He says, instead of having an audience of lots of people so that they might look on you and think you're better than you actually are, have an audience of one. Have an audience who is simply God. Make sure that he is your attention when you're praying. Make sure that you're praying for his benefit, not for other people's. Make sure that you're praying in his direction, not with a sideways glance around to see who's listening to you. 
So I want to encourage you, how could you this month cultivate an audience of one? That you would live your life and that you would pray your prayers directed towards him instead of caring more about what other people are going to think of you. How could you cultivate that audience of one? Maybe you need to take Jesus' words very literally. Sometimes that's a good thing to do. Maybe you need to find a space in your home or on your street or in your office or wherever it is. Maybe you need to find a physical bit of space, go there, shut the rest of the world out, switch off the notifications on your phone, turn it to airplane mode, and simply spend some time with God. The airplane mode bit isn't taking Jesus literally. I'm kind of adding a bit on there. But maybe you need to do that. Maybe you need to decide a chair in your house that you only ever sit on to pray. And you know that is my God chair. When I'm on that chair, I'm with God. And no one else is going to know that. No one else needs to know that. Maybe it's going to be a bench in a park nearby. Maybe it's going to be a particular uh, seat where you have lunch every day. But have some time and some space that is set aside simply for God. And no one else needs to know. It's just between you and God. But God, who sees what is done in secret, may reward you. How can you cultivate that audience of one? I want to be clear. I don't think that praying in public is wrong. I don't think that praying and other people hearing is wrong. If I thought that, then I'd, I'd have to tell off at least two other leaders in this church just for their behavior this morning. I don't believe it's wrong to pray in front of other people. We've got a prayer room just back here, and we're encouraging people to sign up sometime this month and use it. It's going to uh, continue beyond this month, but this is a great month to go and spend a bit of time in the prayer room. When you sign up, you just go to our website, and you can sign up, and you can see who's booked other slots. And you might look, look and go, oh, they're very holy. If you were signing up on the prayer room just so that your name would be there, so that other people signing up would look and see that you're there and think that you're really holy, please don't sign up. Please don't do that. Please don't pray out in church services for the benefit of people thinking that you're really holy and spiritual. Please don't pray in a prayer meeting or in your family home so that other people look at you more. By all means, pray in prayer meetings. By all means, pray out in services. By all means, sign up for the prayer room. By all means, pray with your family. But don't do it for their benefit. Do it to pray to God. It's a heart thing. We could take this and apply really rigid rules. That's not what Jesus wants us to do. It's a heart thing. He simply wants you to pray for God. So that's the first thing is about our audience. Who are we praying for? And how can we cultivate that audience of one. The second thing is about our approach, our audience and then our approach, because he carries on and says, and when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Don't be like the hypocrites who pray with a big mask for other people to think they're impressive. Don't be like the pagans who just keep on heaping up more and more words, babbling on and on and on, using more and bigger words all of the time, hoping that their God will notice them, hoping that they will earn an audience or favor with their God because they're using big words or because they're using long prayers or because they're using loads of words. Jesus says, cut it out. Your father already knows what you need before you even ask him. You could look at that and go, well, what's the point of asking him? Because our Father in heaven wants us to come to him, wants us to spend time with him, wants us to talk with him, wants us to pour out our heart to him. What he doesn't need us to try and do is impress him. He doesn't need us to try and appear good enough or clever enough, and then he'll answer our prayers. Or appear uh, intelligent or as, as though we have a, a long, extensive Christian vocabulary. And only then can we enter into his presence and spend time with him and be listened to by him. Again, we could take these words really, really literally and perhaps too literally. And we could say, well, we should never have long prayers. And we should never use big words in our prayers. You know what? If you use big words when you talk, use big words when you pray. If you are someone who talks at length, pray at length. If you're someone who speaks with short sentences and little words, pray with short sentences and little words. Be yourself when you come to God. See, the pagans, the thing that they're doing wrong isn't using long prayers and long words. 
the thing that they're doing wrong is thinking that because they use long words and because they, they pray these big long prayers, suddenly God's going to listen more, like them more, or be impressed with them more. I don't want to pray to a God who I have to impress for two reasons. One is that I'd much rather pray to a God who loves me and simply wants to spend time with me, whether I'm impressive or not. And since I believe that that God exists and made me and wants a relationship with me, I'd much rather pray to him. The second reason that I don't want to have to pray to a God who I have to impress is this. I know that I'm not that impressive. I might be able to fool people from time to time. But the God who made me, who knows my innermost thoughts and secrets and desires and longings and hopes and fears and all of that, he's not going to be impressed by me. He's going to love me. He's going to accept me. He's going to cherish me. He's going to love the time that I spend with him. But he's not going to be impressed by me. If impressing God before he listens to my prayer is what's needed, then I'm kind of scuppered. I may as well quit before I try. See, Jesus simply says, don't need to do that. Your father already knows what's on your heart. Just come and pour it out to him. Come and share it with him. Have an audience of one and use your own voice. That's what prayer is. Prayer is coming as yourself with your own voice to an audience of one. That's what prayer is. Can I encourage you to give it a go? Can I encourage you to try it out? Whether you think you're a prayer or not, whether you think you're a strong prayer or not, simply come, be yourself. You don't have to use any fancy formulas. It doesn't even have to start with dear Lord and end in amen. Pray as you are. Pray with words that you would use. There are, by the way, two reasons that I think that these two principles are so important. So important for us to grasp. One is that the way that we pray to God demonstrates something of what we think God is like. And if we pray in a way that is about impressing other people, like the hypocrites did, then what we're really saying is that the God who we're praying to is in some way comparing us with other people to see who measures up. That somehow we've got to be impressive in the world's eyes, that we've got to measure up favorably against the people sat next to us or the people around us or the people that we meet. And then God might accept us, that somehow we've got to be better than everyone else. We've got to be good enough. That's not the God I believe in. The God I believe in is most fully expressed as his son, Jesus Christ, who came to live with us, who in amongst giving all of this teaching and healing people and caring for people and loving the poor and healing the sick, then at the end of it, died on a cross, taking my blame, taking my guilt, taking my unimpressiveness, taking all the things that I've done wrong, continue to do wrong and will do wrong, on himself so that I can be free of it and instead be given his perfect access to his father. See, if I think I've got to be more impressive than other people, then what that says is that I've got to be good enough. And Jesus hanging on the cross says to you, you don't have to be good enough. I have been and I'm giving it to you. Don't try and impress other people. It doesn't get you any closer to God. It might actually take you further from him. God is better than a God who needs you to imp impress other people. God is also better than a God who needs you to impress him with all of your big long words and fancy vocabulary. He's better than that. He loves you because he loves you because he loves you. And maybe you're thinking, I'd like to pray to this God, but I don't feel as though I know him. Can I encourage you to invite him to become your friend? To invite him to become your father? Can I, can I encourage you to accept what it is that Jesus did for you when he died for you? Can I encourage you to embrace that as a reality in your life, not just as something that happened 2,000 years ago? Can I encourage you to maybe take that step, maybe during this month, maybe this week, maybe today? You want to not just start praying, but you actually want to get to know this God in the first place. If that's you, there's going to be an opportunity later on for you to do that. I said there are two reasons this is so important. One is because it tells us what God is like. And the other is that it's all about what prayer is for. I said earlier on, it's not about pointing around to other people, hoping people will notice us because we're impressive, all looking around horizontally. It's also not, with the pagans, it would be all about this, pointing to yourself, trying to get other people, trying to get God to notice you. God, God, look, look at me, I'm using all the big fancy words. It's not about that. 
Prayer is simply about this. It's simply about me and God. And friends, I believe prayer is powerful. I believe that every great movement of the church throughout the last 2,000 years has been birthed in prayer. You look at the book of Acts, the beginning of the story of God's church, and in pretty much every single chapter, the Christians pray and God moves. The Christians pray and God does something. The Christians pray and they get sent to this place and the church is born there. The Christians pray and, the, and, and, and those who are opposing them are pushed back. The Christians pray and the gospel, the good news of Jesus advances. Prayer is a weapon. Prayer is at the forefront of the church moving forward. I unashamedly am praying for a big move of God this year. That in the year 2020, there would be a fresh move of God's spirit across this land, in this place. But it has to begin in prayer. It has to begin with us seeking God for that. Prayer is huge. But not just on those big national church kind of levels and scales. Prayer is huge in our own lives. I believe if we want to see breakthrough, I believe if we want to see freedom, if we want to see healing, if we want to see all of these things, prayer is part of it. And I know that hoping that God will answer prayer can lead us to disappointment. I know that praying for something and not seeing it happen can be gut-wrenching. I've experienced that. I continue to experience that with things in my own life. But friends, I believe God at his word when he says that he listens to our prayers, that because of our prayers, things shift, things change. See, Jesus, when he's giving this teaching, when he says, go into your room in private, And just pray to God there. He says, and your father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Reward you not in the sense of, oh, you've been holy enough. Well done, good boy, good girl. I'm going to give you a nice shiny new thing. But in the sense of, he will draw us into his presence. He will take us from where we are into where he can see things from. And as a result of that, things will align in a way that is more in line with his will and more in line with what is right for us. Won't always be easy, won't always be simple. But friends, prayer works. Prayer changes things. And if we minimize prayer down, if we say, well, prayer is just something I'm going to use to look holy to other people, then we're missing the power of prayer. And if we think, well, prayer is this thing I'm going to use to try and be impressive to God, then we are missing the power of prayer. When we pray with an audience of one as ourselves, When we simply come before our Father and shout at him and give him all of our frustrations and confusions and doubts and complaints and anger. And we give him all of our hopes and our joys and our life and our love. When we give him whatever it is that's in our heart, we open up our heart and we just give it to him. I believe that is a powerful thing. It's a powerful, powerful thing. So when we start this month of prayer, It's not just something that we're doing because we feel we should. It's something we're doing because we believe that God wants to move and we believe that God moves when his people pray. We believe that setting aside this time, deciding each one of us to pray each day in simple ways, and we decide to commit to doing something else that we'll look at in a couple of weeks, fasting, as Jesus encourages his followers to do. Details about that are all in the booklet. When we we choose... To walk in the way that Jesus led his first followers. In intimacy and closeness with our Father in heaven. I believe that prayer is a powerful thing. It's been my hope and my intent this morning. To encourage you to pursue prayer in a new and a fresh way. My hope is that there might be people here this morning. Who actually are going to pursue God for the first time. If that's you, please make yourself known to someone. Come talk to me at the end. I'd love to pray for you. But right now, I'm, I'm going to pray. Hopefully not like a hypocrite. Hopefully not like a pagan. I'm going to pray using my voice. I'm going to pray for God. And yes, you may listen. But as I do, I'm going to leave some space and pause for you to say something to God. Whatever it is that you want to. You can say that. You can mutter it. You can say it out loud. You can say it in your mind. He sees what's unseen. And he hears what's unheard. I'm going to give you a space to say something to God. And then I'm going to pray. So go for it.
Lord God, you know what is being said to you in each of these hearts, in each of these minds, here and joining online. You know what it is we've said. You know our tears, you know our laughter. You know it all. I want to pray that you'd help me, help us. Be more real with you. Experience and know that relationship with you. Thank you, you made us for a relationship. You didn't make us and stay away. You made us and drew close. God, help us to draw close. You've given us prayer to do that. So help us. Teach us and lead us to pray. For the first time or for the thousandth time.